Okay, so I feel perhaps given that I'm following two talks on sort of roughly similar areas, I should try and frame what I'm about to tell you in the context of those talks. Um, so what I'm going this method is basically it's an energy method, so it probably shares most in common with these charism and parism type methods. Um, but it's um, we don't assume radiosity, so we, we assume that we can incorporate some directivity into the reflection. Um, and this means we don't have to take an ensemble average over a set of rooms. For example, we can model an exact room given a prescribed geometry. What we do have to do in averaging is we have to take a frequency average because we neglect phase. So we take a band average and assume that the phases are incoherent and then we get just a pure, um, a pure geometric model effectively in the end. So I'd, I'd, that's kind of the rough synopsis, and I'll just perhaps say a little bit more about the details now. Um, I'm afraid the talk is a little bit technical compared to some of the others, but there's a good reason for that, is that the methodology is quite um, in its infancy, so I don't really have a great deal of applications-focused slides to show you. All that can really explain to you is how we develop the method and show you the initial applications that we've looked at. Um, so as Jonathan mentioned, with this, uh, this work's funded by a, an EU Framework 7, uh, IAPP, which is Industry, Academia, Partnerships and Pathways grant called MIVEC, which is Mid to High Frequency Modelling of Vehicle Noise and Vibration. Um, and this is a project with both ourselves, Nottingham Trent, um, along with a couple of industrial collaborators, CDH and Inutech, they're two German software companies. Uh, we work with the Dynamics Group from ISVR in Southampton, uh, and also uh, quite a few people from the University of Nottingham, sort of local collaboration. Uh, I should also perhaps say, his name's on the front, Yanis is my postdoc and he's responsible for a lot of this work, so I can't really not credit him here. Uh, so the aim, we're looking at vibroacoustics, so not just acoustics, but also vibrations and, and hopefully eventually coupling between acoustics and vibrations in, in kind of complex systems. And we're looking at wave energies, so the, the related work historically starts out with statistical energy analysis, and then there's been many ways in which people have tried to refine statistical energy analysis, because it is a relatively coarse theory, but when it works, it works very well, as those of you who know about it will know. Um, so the two people who kind of developed it further in a way that kind of leads on to what we do were Langley in uh, Cambridge and Labatt in Lyon. Um, so our family of methods is really based on this thing called dynamical energy analysis. And the name uh, comes from the fact that um, statistical energy analysis, we, we're kind of stemming from that, but we're including information about the ray dynamics. So the underlying dynamics of the system come in, so that's why that name was given to this method. Um, and kind of latterly, this discrete flow mapping, which was on the title slide, this is to do with basically applying dynamical energy analysis rather than on kind of a coarse-grained multi-subsystem model, actually applying it on a, on a mesh grid. So you, you're, you're kind of tracking the flow through elements of a mesh. So it's a discrete flow in that way. Um, so I, I guess I'll skim through these, these slides a little bit quickly because it's, the first few slides here are just going to say how you get to an energy formulation from a wave equation, which some of you will know already, I guess. But... Um, Okay, so we look at wave equation problems, so the reduced wave equation, Helmholtz equation. Um, we can consider either problems with point sources or problems with boundary conditions. That's all these slides are saying. Then we look in the high frequency limits, so we make the psychonal ansatz. We express our solution as a sum of amplitudes and phases. The amplitude terms can include, well, they include the, the geometrics. They also include any, any dissipation. Um, and if you're in some sort of built-up system with changes of parameters and you have reflections and transmissions and things like this, that all comes in as well. Now, if you move to an energetic model, what you do is you look at square amplitudes of, of, of the wave. Um, the acoustic energy density is, is given by this formula here, where if you use the pressure, basically. Um, and doing that and then putting that into the sarcona lens, you end up with this double sum over ray trajectories. Um, which you can then split into, into cases where j equals j prime, so you're taking the same trajectory twice, uh, and cases where j is not equal to j prime. And if you do this and then take an average over frequency, basically you can 
assuming the phases are incoherent and you don't have these kind of special cases where you have these localization effects, then you can basically get rid of the second term and you end up with just a pure unphased approximation. Um, okay, so, so the kind of little bit at the bottom there um, basically says that what we do is instead of actually tracking individual rays, what we're going to look at is the density of rays as this function rho that we want to solve for. So this thing here. And rho depends on r, the position that you are in space. And you can get this rho by summing up over the square amplitudes of all the rays that come in and hit the point r. Okay? But how you could also consider this is you, you could consider it more in a sort of continuous view. So instead of looking at discrete ray trajectories coming in, you can imagine that your ray density depends on the direction you're looking. Okay? So instead of summing up over individual rays, you, you raise your ray density into phase space, so it has both position and direction dependence, and then you sum over all the rays coming in by integrating over all the directions that you're looking around you, and that's how you get this row in phase space, which is the principal object that we're kind of solving for in our methods. So, to trans so these densities rho, we have to transport them along ray trajectories. And we do this using this operator called the peron frobenius operator. And what that basically does is if you have this trajectory map phi here, so phi is the, is the physical trajectory map which takes you along that trajectory. Um, and you basically say if you have some initial density rho zero and you project along your trajectory for a time tor, okay, then if that trajectory map takes you to the solution point that you want to get to, then you include it in this sum. So this integral with a delta, you can kind of view it as a sum every time phi t of y and x coincide. Okay? So you add up the contributions from all initial points rho zero that end up in the point you want to end up in, x. Okay? Um, so this is, this is kind of the the kind of slightly up-in-the-sky theory way of thinking about it, but to make it more concrete and get something we can actually work with, instead of having this trajectory flow through time in general, what we've done is we've said, let's make this trajectory flow uh, a kind of discrete thing. So instead of just flowing the trajectory through time, what it does is it takes you from one point on your boundary with a prescribed direction and then traces out until you hit the boundary again. Okay, so instead of evolving you continuously along the trajectory, what you do is you start on the boundary, you point in a direction, you say, right, I apply the map, and that takes me until I hit the boundary again, and then I reflect, and then I have a new point and a new direction. So that's my new, it's called the boundary map here. Um, so you basically do the same thing. You apply the same operator to project your density along this boundary flow map. Okay, so you get... In that way, what it does is it takes you along one trajectory evolution from one point on the boundary to another. I've also added in this function w here, and that's because um, you, want, you might want to include more physics than just projecting your flow along trajectories. Um, so in there, you, I, I, I you know, loosely say you can, can incorporate reflection and transmission at interfaces. You can incorporate mode conversion if you have elasticity problems. You can also incorporate damping as well. So it just, that just brings in a whole other load of things that you might want to model. And then to build this up into, a, into an algorithm, if you start off with a point source problem, what you have to first do is get everything that you want to work with onto the boundary. So you project out your source onto the boundary to get this initial density rho zero. If you have a boundary value problem to start with, you already can kind of infer rho zero somehow. But you might have to think a bit about what the directionality should be. Um, second step is you apply this, this operator to project through reflections. And what you do is every time you apply the operator, it maps your density along a trajectory until you hit your boundary again. So you apply iterates of this operator. So you keep iterating the operator, and it keeps taking your, your density along these trajectories, reflecting and bouncing it around your enclosure. Okay? And so what we end up with is the stationary density that you get in the, in the long time limit after you look at all the reflections and sum them all up. Okay? And this, if you have some... So here's where you have to have some damping in, because for this infinite sum to converge, what you need is to have some damping in the operator so that then you can basically do this computation. 
Um, and finally, what you end up with from stage two here is this object, this row, this density on the boundary, which depends on both position and direction pointing into the domain. Uh, and if you want to visualize and take some point inside and say, what's the density there? Then you integrate around the boundary, okay? So you add up the contributions from all those boundary densities and you pick the direction for your, so you, you have a function here which depends on all directions and you pick the direction that points back to the source point, that, to the, the solution point that you want to get to. Um, so the, the key point really is, is the stage two where you, where you do this, you solve this integral equation and you compute this operator. Everything else can be kind of viewed as pre or post processing in some sense. Um, so here's this, here's this integral operator that you want to work with, here's the integral equation that you want to solve. It's a second kind integral equation, if you're familiar at all with boundary element methods, they're quite a familiar object to you, if not then I apologise. Um, and dynamical energy analysis that I mentioned at the start, this basically is a term that I kind of now use to encompass any of several variants of methods to discretize and solve this integral equation over a set of subsystems, okay, so over a multi-domain structure. Um, in ways we've tried, we've done spectral methods, we've done boundary element Gilurkin methods, um, due to, you know, wanting to improve efficiency or apply to certain types of problems, we have adapted the method over the years. Um, I say over the years, we've, this is since 2009, so it's all relatively new. Uh, and more latterly, we've looked at kind of applying these methodologies on, on, on mesh grids. So our, our boundary operator now takes your flow between edges of, a, of, a, of, of elements of a mesh, effectively. Um, so why would you do this? Well, it's a way into modeling quite complex systems, for one thing, because if you go to an industrial collaborator and you say, can we have some data about the problem you want to model, they often have a mesh, in fact. So that gives you a starting point. Um, and also, because mesh elements tend to be quite geometrically simple, they're often triangles, uh, quadrilaterals or something, and 3D, you can think uh, tetrahedra. Um, and you can use this simplicity to, to kind of work out these matrices B in a sort of semi-analytic fashion. So there's various integrals you've got to compute, and you can do them exactly, or at least you can do half of them exactly, um, when you have geometric simplicity to, to work things out properly. Um, so what it, the kind of first step that you always do is you take the thing you want to compute and you project it onto some basis. Uh, so this is a really generic statement here and, and a little bit ugly. Um, but yeah, basically we say that this function row that we want to compute is some sum of coefficients multiplied by some basis functions. And there's a basis function for space and a basis function for direction. Um, Okay, maybe I won't say too much more about that, but just to say most efficient computing happens when you have low order and local approximations in space, and when you do higher order and global approximations in direction. One reason for that, in fact, is that um, in direction you always have quite a simple space. So in, in 2D problems, the, the, the direction domain is just an interval, and in 3D problems the direction domain is a disk. So it's always, it's always something that you can do globally quite nicely, Whereas position space can obviously be whatever mesh that somebody throws at you. Um, the shop tower, for example, is that what I just showed from a, a Range Rover. Uh, so what basis functions are we using? Um, in direction space, we typically use, in 2D, Legendre polynomials, and in 3D, Zernicke polynomials. So the, the main thing here is we want them to be orthogonal, orthonormal, preferably. Um, and these are choices which are, which are orthonormal, in the first case on an interval, and in the second case on a disk. Uh, in space, we tend to use more boundary element type approximations, so just like piecewise constants. Um, but we can, in 2D, we can at least go up higher and use Legendre polynomials too. In 3D, that becomes a bit more of an issue. So if you want to compute this operator in 3D, what you have to do is you have to look at transitions of rays between edges of tetrahedra. So we, we've only done 3D with tetrahedral meshes, okay? So you're looking at rays going from one face of a tetrahedra to another face of a tetrahedra, and you have to do this four-dimensional integral. The ones in orange, 
the two in the middle you can do analytically okay and you do it analytically because you basically you look at the direction of your ray so so the outer integrals are the direction ones so when you come to here you know your direction so you look at the direction that you point out you project down from the vertex opposite the face that you're on and you use that to subdivide your triangle into three triangles okay the only one for, so this divides you into all the rays that hit the back face, all the rays that hit this face, and all the rays that hit that face. Okay? Um, and you're just looking at interactions between pairs of faces. So you just have to integrate over the, over the blue triangle in the case shown here. Okay? Um, and for the direction integration, so this animation sort of shows you a little bit what happens to your integration region as the dire direction changes. So this kind of slowly animates over all possible directions coming out of the base and pointing to the face at the back there, the pink face. Um, and you see, basically, the region you have to integrate analytically in space changes. It's the blue region. Um, and you see always the extent of this blue triangle is given by the projection down from this vertex along your specified direction. Um, right, so that's that. But what this also automatically gives you is a subdivision for your integration over, over direction. So over direction, as I said, you're integrating over a disk. And if you project, so this is kind of a top-down view of that previous slide. Okay, here's the vertex above, and here's the three base vertices. If you then basically use this and project it onto the disk, you get a subdivision of... of directions on the disk. So the ones in the blue triangle in the middle are the ones that come out of the base and can hit all three faces of the tetrahedra. The ones on the yellow bit here are the ones that can hit this face or this face, the one joined to this edge and this edge. Okay, and you can go around and you, you basically subdivide into these regions according to how many faces your ray can hit. Okay? And importantly what this does is these are the boundary regions of where your function is very regular that you're integrating. So if you split your integration up along these lines, inside those regions you have a smooth function and you can integrate it spectrally. So you can do the inner two integrals exactly and the outer two integrals just by using the information that you need to do the exact integration anyway, you get a splitting of your numerical integrals which means you can do them spectrally fast. Um, so here's you know, just showing you we get spectrally fast integration for those direction integrals. Uh, and this is a problem that we've looked at. This is, this is a car cavity. Um, I think it's some sort of camper van. It was given to us by CDH. So there's 632 tetrahedra in that mesh. It's, uh, like I say, an interior cavity of a vehicle. Um, and this is just the, you know, one of the first tests we've tried. And we've just put a, basically a perfectly reflecting, reflecting boundary condition over most of the structure. Apart from on this very front section here, where we've just input a kind of unit Neumann condition, effectively, and just looked at what happens, right? So it's piecewise constants over each of the triangle faces in space. And then in direction, we use these Zernike polynomials of some order to, to define the directivity. So this first picture here is with zero for the directivity. So it basically is a purely diffusive propagation model. And you see that what happens when you go higher order and you incorporate more directionality as you might expect, you get more transmission of energy into the cavity. Um, okay. So these, we can get to quite complex problems by looking at propagation through meshes. Um, this calculation in this cavity here, I think, was about 30 minutes. Typically, we look to do things in under an hour. Um, so what we're currently doing is we're looking at trying to validate our method in 3D to start with and look at complex multi-room interior systems and effectively, and also eventually look at fluid structure coupling, so to look at how the car body and the, and the interior volume couple together. Um, so future directions are to build up to full vehicle models, that's a CU project. Uh, the guys over in Nottingham are also working on developing these methods for electromagnetic wave problems. Um, and that's all. So thanks for your attention and any questions.